Hello everyone. I want to start with a huge welcome to this seminar from the Anna Freud Centre's Early Years in Mind Learning Network. We're so pleased you could join us. Please can I ask if any of you are tweeting about the event to use the hashtag Early Years in Mind. I'll start by introducing myself for those of you who haven't been to one of our webinars before. I'm Camilla Rosen and I work at the Anna Freud Centre as head of the Early Years and Prevention Department. I'm a psychologist by background, but I've also worked in nurseries and in children's centres across my career. Um, and at the main, at the moment, my main kind of interaction with the nurseries is with my daughter, who's four. So she's just at that point before she's about to start school. Before I introduce our three fabulous speakers, I would like to let you know a little bit about our Early Years in Mind network and what the network might be able to offer you if you haven't joined us before in particular. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So what exactly is the Early Years in Mind Network? It's our free online resource and learning network for people who work with early years aged children. And we're kind of aiming at early years staff across the board. So that might be nursery staff or childminders, health visitors, play workers, or others involved in the field. Most of the content will offer benefits to all staff who work with young children but some might be aimed at specific settings. We aim for all of the things that we produce to be easy to read and accessible. Um, and we provide simple tools and guidance on the best ways to support the mental health needs of babies, young children and their families. We also aim to offer to explore an, in an easy way what it, attachment informed practice is, that's what we're all about. And to provide tips on how early years workers can use it in their work. And at the moment we've got, uh, around 14,000 members since we launched in June. So we're really proud of the kind of interaction we've had, but also I think it illustrates um, people's interest and need for this kind of work. On the next slide. So some examples of the early years in mind sections of the website are our A to Z of common difficulties. So this section offers tips on how to understand and manage a range of issues that you told us that you wanted help with. So things like aggression, bereavement, trauma, which is the focus of today, um, sharing, separation, anxiety, toileting, play, um, a whole range of things. Next slide. And then we've got some general resources on the early years that you can use and download and um, that again are designed a, a lot around what you said you wanted help with. Um, and we're currently working on a few additional um, interesting developments. So this is going to include a new section of the website that will provide guidance on working with particularly vulnerable families. Um, we're going to do some free e-learning modules and we're also about to go live with the section of the website hopefully in, in the next month or so on staff well-being. We've surveyed over a thousand um, childcare workers to understand what contributes to well-being in the um, setting and pulled that together into a helpful resource. Um, next slide. So sign up is completely free and members who sign up to the network, hopefully lots of you, um, that's how you came to be here today. But if not, please do sign up. Um, people that sign up to the network receive an e-newsletter which keeps them abreast with all the latest developments, including events like this. So next one. Um, so back to the reason for this particular webinar, at the end of last year, we um, sent out a survey to early years workers and over 900 of you replied and 69% that said they had experience working with children affected by trauma or abuse. 69% and 71% said they had worked with children affected by domestic violence. Um, and over half said that they had not received any additional training alongside their standard training that related to early years mental health help them in managing these difficulties. So that's why we decided to run the event today. The webinar is the final in a series of three that were arranged as a response to the results of our survey. Um, the first one looked at managing challenging behaviours in early years settings, um, which is on the slide here, and then a, a link to the YouTube um, if people want to rewatch it if they weren't able to make it. Um, next slide. Similarly, the next one was um, on supporting bereaved children in early year settings. Um, and so again, um, this is the link to watch it again on YouTube. 
For this particular event, we also um, developed a downloadable resource on managing bereavement in early years settings, which you can find on our resources page. So next slide. Oh, there's the bereavement resource. And um, next one. Um, and all this work wouldn't be possible without the kind of contributions of you when you respond to our surveys and get in touch and tell us um, what's going on. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out more about the survey um, or our findings, then please read our report, Their Challenges or Our Challenges, which you can download from our website here. Okay, next slide. That's it from me, my quick overview. We'll kind of um, stop sharing and I will, uh, start the focus of today's session, which is on supporting children affected by trauma and abuse. So today we have two very different presentations. The first will offer, offer a clinician's perspective from two of our wonderful Anna Freud Centre therapists. And the second, Louise Jackson, will offer a nursery worker's perspective. Both will be supplying much valuable insights, so I really hope that you'll be able to stay for the two talks. It's possible and, and likely that some of the content of the session may be upsetting or triggering as trauma can touch us all. So please do look after yourself and engage in the session as much as is safe for you. So now I'd like to introduce our first set of speakers. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Sheila Redfern and, and, and Teresa Schwager. Sheila is head of the family trauma department at the Anna Freud Centre and she's a consultant clinical psychologist by background with over 25 years experience working with children and young people and families. And Teresa, who will be joining her, is uh, also a clinical psychologist and, and works together with Sheila in the family trauma um, department where she provides assessment and treatment for children and families who are in care or at the edges of care. Together they are a formidable team. I'm looking forward to their talk, which is entitled understanding the impact of family trauma and how to spot where it may have affected a child in your setting. Over to you both. Thank you, Camilla. Um, it's wonderful to be part of this webinar and I'm really pleased that so many people are able to attend and hear a little bit about some of our work as well as um, some of the other work that's happening in the early years uh, department. So, Teresa and I sit in the other department under the clinical division at the Anna Freud Centre, and that's the Department of Family Trauma. So when we present this talk today, as Camilla said, some of the things that we touch on might feel um, unsettling for some people and might also um, prompt you to think about some of the children that you're working with. So what we're, we hope is that through our talk and this presentation of the kind of work that we do in our department, We'll be able to give you a little bit of a definition of family trauma, um, illustrate some of the children and, and young babies that we've worked with and help you to think a little bit about how you notice it in your own setting and then how you might support children in your setting yourself. Uh, so if we go to the first slide, please, Therese, thank you. So when we talk about trauma in childhood, what we're thinking of is mainly relational or sometimes called developmental trauma. And Bessel van der Kolk gave a very good definition of this when he talked about what's, what's happening in, in the early years. He said, our brains continually form maps of the world, maps of what is safe and what is dangerous. And when I read that quote, I immediately think about attachment relationships and how very young babies from right from the beginning, actually even before birth, are starting to form a map about other people. Usually their main caregiver, um, is this person safe for me? Hopefully this person can teach me about the world, but also teach me about myself. Unfortunately, the children that we work with in our department very rarely have that secure attachment experience. And they have a very disrupted attachment experience often, which leads to what we think of as relational trauma. So that's where there is a consistent disruption of the child's sense of being safe, feeling loved within their family, whether that's their birth family or their caregiver. And why this is so particularly important and I suppose profoundly affecting the babies and young children 
is that this is meant to be the relationship that they get their most um, secure sense of themselves and others in the world from. And so where we see that disrupted um, and where we see family trauma emerging is often where there's a disruption or abandonment or even an enmeshment within that early relationship. And just to say what that word means to people who might not have come across it, where perhaps the caregiver, the mother or the father or the relative who's caring for the baby becomes so involved in their world that there's no separation between self and other. Um, that can be just as traumatizing as where there's a carer who um, abandons and, and gives that young baby um, no sense of, of safety. So the kind of trauma that we work with in our service can be caused by that parent or caregiver um, who is meant to be offering that sense of safety, um, actually neglecting or abusing, um, as Camilla gave that statistic, that a large number of children that you are worried about will have experienced sexual abuse. It could be physical abuse or emotional abuse. Um, they may have witnessed violence. So when we talk about trauma, we're really thinking about trauma in the context of a relationship. And the impact of that is so profound that it will affect how children then relate to other people going forwards. And that's why it's so important to recognise the early signs of relational trauma and to try and do whatever you can in your work setting to address it. Because we know that the long term consequences of a disruption to that early attachment relationship has profound impact um, on the relationships that the child will have for the rest of their life. Go to the next slide, please. A word about cultural um, context and, and trauma there, that in all your work, it's clearly going to be really important to think about the kind of family that the children you're working with come from and to have an awareness of what uh, the cultural um, norms might be within that family, but also to ensure that your staff uh, feel culturally competent and are able to acknowledge the things that they don't know about some cultures and other families. And that should obviously be kind of a key part of your work and how you approach uh, working with children, but also perhaps to develop an awareness that there can be additional trauma caused to children by uh, discrimination, whether that's on the grounds of race, gender, perhaps their developmental ability, you might have children who are delayed in their development, their social class, all of these factors, if they're not taken into account in your care for young children, can be further traumatizing for perhaps an already. Uh, traumatic um, relationship within the family. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to hand over to Teresa, who's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the ways that you can see the sort of signs of trauma and distress. Thank you, Sheila. So what we would um, recommend, um, if you would like to identify, for instance, babies experiencing traumatic distress, is observe and pay attention closely to their um, separation reunion with their caregivers um, when they're brought to nursery and picked up, as well as um, also being curious about your own reactions to the child and the parents, meaning how the baby makes you feel and being with the baby makes you feel as well as um, observing the baby with their parents. And what's quite striking for babies who experience distress is that often it can be very difficult to read what they need and it might be quite confusing the way they um, express their distress. So you might find babies who are um, traumatically distressed crying persistently um, and it might be difficult to soothe them. Babies might also struggle with sleeping or they might sleep too much because that's a way of disengaging from their environment and cutting off from an environment that feels difficult and um, overwhelming potentially. They might respond um, in, a, uh, in a very reduced way to attempts to be playful with them. Um, and because, of course, they haven't developed a way of expressing um, what they feel verbally, their expression of distress will be very much on a physical level by, for instance, arching away by squirming or by becoming very rigid. So you might find that babies who are um, distressed because of trauma might find it difficult to sink, sink into your arms when you offer a hug. Um, and potentially because that um, wasn't an experience that felt safe to them with their parents. So they might struggle to, um, to experience that with other caregivers as well. 
There might be a lack of interaction with adults um, and very little expression of need, particularly if the need perhaps wasn't met or was responded to um, with fear um, or with um, dismissiveness. Um, babies might also show very limited eye contact or no eye contact, and they might show a limited range of feelings if their feelings haven't been responded to in a way that had felt helpful for those babies. Thinking about toddlers now and young children, similarly, you would observe them closely with their caregivers in terms of how they respond to separating from their parents as well as from you once they know you well, and to be curious about how you feel. So toddlers and young children might find it difficult to separate. They might show quite a lot of clinginess um, or they might alternate between approaching you and avoiding you. So it might be quite confusing the way children express what they need for you as well as for the child. So it might be a child approaches you, freezes halfway through, turns around and walks away again, for instance. Or they might be quite indiscriminate towards you, even if they haven't met you, it might feel as though the child almost treats you as though you're a familiar um, family member to them, which can sometimes be due to unmet need and just the need of, of all of us and, and particularly young children to be seen, held and cared for. What we notice a lot in children who have experienced significant relational trauma are emotion regulation difficulties. And those can manifest in lots of different ways. For instance, through crying, through cutting off from feelings because they're so overwhelming and nobody is helping them to manage those feelings that they zone out a lot, for instance. Or they might become quite aggressive towards you as caregivers, as well as their peers. All violence that they experience in the home might surface in their play with dolls or figures or animals. Children might be very hypervigilant and very alert to their environment. Um, and because um, they experience their environment at home potentially as very frightening, they cannot settle into playing because they are very busy trying to work out whether they are safe. And that can really impact on their development of playfulness and their imaginative development, as well as their relational development, of course. Um, they might present with developmental delay, um, for instance, in terms of their speech, their motor development, as well as in their play. Or if something else significant happens at home, they might go backwards in their development. For instance, if they've been toilet trained, suddenly they might be soiling or wetting again. Sometimes children also show an age inappropriate independence in that they don't tell you when they need something, but rather manage everything by themselves. And at first sight, they might not be the children that um, you pay that much attention to because they internalize their difficulties and they don't express it outwardly in their behavior. But really, it's very worrying when children cannot experience adults as safe and, and, and as helpful. And um, they might also express distress more in terms of physical complaints, sometimes because they haven't learned to name their feelings or even identify what the feelings are they experience. So um, they might express their distress through um, complaining about stomach aches, pains or headaches a lot. So I'm now going to demonstrate or illustrate some of those um, signs based on two case examples. I'm going to start talking about seven month old Max, who was referred to our service by the local authority um, in the context of care proceedings. There was a question whether his mum was able to look after him as well as his dad, but the focus was his mum, who had experienced sadly very severe childhood trauma herself and had experienced very significant mental health problems for many years. And so the focus of the assessment was on Max's relationship with mum. And so when we do assessments, we draw on our observations as well as on how it makes us feel to be with the family and how and what that tells us. So over the course of about eight sessions in different combinations, seeing Max and his mum and dad, um, I observed Max not ever looking at mum, but always looking sideways or up to the ceiling. He also was very agitated. He moved a lot. He kicked his arms. He was waving his arms, both when on the floor as well as in mum's arms. So he couldn't relax into her arms. When, he, when she was giving him uh, a milk bottle, um, he avoided looking at mum. He um, wanted to hold the bottle himself. And he then immediately um, went off mum's lap, actually, when, um, when, when he was finished drinking. 
he also um, arched away from mum a number of times when mum tried to engage with him um, and play with him, which was, a she had very good intentions, but she couldn't quite read his cues. So he would arch away and become more distressed by becoming very rigid in his body and waving his arms more. But he never cried out or expressed the distress the way we would expect a baby to do. Um, so there was very little being together and it felt there was uh, constant interference um, and a request to play rather than Max being able to settle and observe and watch a little bit. And then with his father, he was quite unsettled emotionally, he was crying a lot, it was very difficult to soothe him. And just to say we are, of course, also we noticed positive interactions between mum and baby, but for the purpose of this, of this um, presentation, we are focusing on uh, signs of traumatic distress. So the way I was left feeling being with this family, with Max and mum and dad, I, was, I felt very stressed and agitated at times. Um, I felt pulled into smiling um, a lot of the time, like mum wanted of Max to smile at her for reassurance, saying, you're not in a good mood, come on, give me a smile. So there were lots of demands placed. I felt overwhelmed at times because there was no moment um, that allowed thinking together and just having, taking a breath really. Um, and the pull towards wanting to protect, protect Max in terms of allowing him a bit of space to calm down and be more regulated. So I'm coming on to a different case now, four-year-old Stilara, um, who was referred for an assessment and treatment. Um, and at that point, she was already in foster care because she'd experienced significant physical abuse, had witnessed domestic violence and neglect. Um, and I saw Dilara when she'd been living with her foster care already for a couple of years. And what I noticed over the course of about four or five times that I saw them was that she didn't seek out her primary caregiver as a safe person to refer to when she felt anxious. And I noticed she was highly anxious. She was very alert to her environment. She noticed any changes between sessions. For instance, she noticed I didn't bring black, back a black pen. And she noticed the way I looked and commented how she hardly recognized me in, in, a, in, a, in a very anxious and sort of suspicious way almost. She was quite controlling, so everything was on her terms. So the way I would understand that, that she was really terrified of what might happen next and the way of managing that fear is um, controlling what happens next really. So not following my suggestions for play. She found it difficult to end the sessions. Um, she avoided talking or thinking about um, negative feelings when I, when I was curious about them and would immediately move away and start a different activity. Um, she tidied up a lot and cleaned up a lot and put things into order rather than playing. And again, I would say that's partly to do with high levels of anxiety about what might come up, for instance, when she was playing or when I encouraged her to play with the doll's house, looking at the home environment, what does that evoke for her? And I felt it was very difficult for her to engage in that. And she didn't actually, she avoided it. She presented with very low self-esteem. She, um, she ripped apart the drawing, drawings that she made, saying she felt very disappointed it hadn't turned out the way she had hoped it would. And she was very agitated, moving between different activities. So the way I felt with Dilara was quite a bit out of control, um, sometimes confused because there was very little coherence in terms of Dilara's behavior. And it was unclear moment by moment what caused her distress and why she was moving away to do something else. And I also felt that Dilara considered me a possible threat, the way she sort of gazed at me and the way she questioned everything that, that was, was provided for her in terms of the toys and what had gone missing and so on. So we would really encourage you as childcare workers to pay attention to how you feel when you're with a child and observe a child with their parents. Um, because it can be such helpful um, information for you as to what might be going on for a child that's very distressed. You might experience yourself feel very confused a lot of the time, the child behaving in a challenging manner, apparently without no reason. You might find yourself very frustrated when, you try, when you're faced with opposition behavior or children who reject your help continuously. It can be really difficult. You might experience very high levels of stress because children who have been traumatized can sometimes make us feel the way they really feel. For instance, helpless, scared and out of control. 
You might experience a sense of discomfort observing parents and children together. So might, do they freeze when they see their parents come into the room? Is there a lack of joy upon reunion? Do you even want to avoid going back home with their parents? And lastly, you might experience um, within the team very contradictory views and feelings about the child and the family members. That, and they can't go into the, the reasons why that might be, but that happens a lot. It's very common when you work with families who've been traumatized. And it's worth paying attention to that and trying to understand what might be going on. Handing over back to you, Sheila. Thanks, Teresa. I, I, I sort of, even sitting listening to that as a member of the team and head of that service, it still really strikes me just how big the impact is of being around mm. children who've experienced trauma. And yeah. so I'm, I'm trying to imagine what it feels like for some of you listening to this talk. And I think one of the things that really comes to mind before I go through some of the things that you can do is just how important it is to have a team around you. Mm. So the work that Teresa has just described with those two um, young people, the, the, the toddler and the baby, all of that work wasn't held by Teresa on her own. And the kind of impact that that has on on Teresa, on me, on any member of our team can be quite profound and you really need to share the impact of that work and being in relationship to children who've had trauma with a team who can help you think about it together. Being on your own with that kind of work is extremely difficult and not recommended. So I think before I go through these um, kind of tips, perhaps that's just a really important thing to, to flag up. But there are things clearly that you can do. And a lot of that is about watching and noticing and paying attention to what's going on with young children in your care. I, I didn't mention earlier, and I meant to, that some of these signs and, and symptoms do look a lot like post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you're familiar with that and the kind of traumatic response that um, children and adults have when they've had a, a hugely traumatic incident, whether that's a fire or a kind of shocking event, then you, you see similar signs in young children. And this hypervigilance is one of them. So you can help a child who's experienced trauma by sort of noticing the kinds of things that perhaps make them hypervigilant and give some explanations to it. So you might want to give a bit of a running commentary. So if you notice a child suddenly jump from a loud noise, you could let the child know, you could voice really what they might be thinking. Oh, that's a loud noise from that car outside. Um, so it's normal to kind of respond in that way. And a child might feel that it, their, their feelings don't have an explanation behind them because they haven't been given that explanation and reflection in their early childhood. Um, comfort and reassurance to the child. I'm sure this is a given for most of you in your work, but some children, as Teresa pointed out with her case, will take a lot of time, will need a lot of time, and a lot of reassurance in order to feel calm. Um, and expressing for them that the feeling's quite big, it's too big for them. Um, they're just a small little person and they're, they're, they're carrying a feeling that can feel very big, sometimes too big to carry alone. And so giving a sense of, I'm here with you, um, I, can, I can think about this feeling with you will be extremely helpful. And again, voicing that aloud, which is the next point really that, you know, children who've experienced relational trauma often don't have a name for their feelings. And so feelings become very confusing. And in later life, relationships become confusing because they don't have these labels. So just saying, you know, I'm sorry, you seem so sad or you seem so frightened or, or you look really excited about that sand play is a really helpful thing that you can do in everyday care of the children you're responsible for. Building in activities that increase a sense of worth. So praise for things that a child does, no matter how small. Um, it's really important for somebody who's experienced abuse and neglect and perhaps feels quite worthless um, and that other relationships can't be trusted and that people don't value them. And that brings me to the last couple of points that relationship is key and relational work is key. So you being consistent, warm and reliable, having a trusting relationship, avoiding any kind of sudden changes, all of these things will be extremely helpful to the traumatized child. And then finally, trying to make the environment as predictable as possible so that they know what's coming up, even though it might seem obvious to you and some of the other children, 
things could seem quite frightening and sudden and unexpected to a child who's experienced trauma. So you might say, for instance, you know, dad's coming to pick you up at three o'clock. Uh, this is going to be happening, you know, in the next 10 minutes so that events start to feel more predictable um, and, and you seem a reliable uh, and trustworthy source of that information. Okay, I think that is the end of our presentation. Um, and we're going to take some questions later on because um, we're going to have a, a, another chance to hear uh, a presentation from Louise next. And I'll, I'll let, let uh, Camilla introduce her, but we we'll look forward to hearing your questions a bit later. Yeah. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Teresa. It was a really, really powerful and clear talk um, with some really kind of helpful strategies that I think um, the audience will find really useful in their day-to-day -day practice. So thank you so much. Um, so on that note, um, which uh, Sheila's just flagged, I wanted to remind everyone to use the Q&A function to submit um, any questions they have to the panel members at the end of the talks. Um, and just to remind everyone that a video and the slides and links will be available to you all after the session. Um, so now to our next speaker, Louise Jackson, who's Deputy Head of St Lawrence's Primary School and Nursery in Shropshire. And Louise has often uh, experienced working with children who are affected by trauma at her settings. And she previously worked as a senior advisor for early years at the Herefordshire Local Authority. And as well as her work in the classroom, Louise also works as an early years consultant and trainer, developing new training. And she's the author of a range of books, including a book entitled Cultivating Resilience in Early Childhood. So we're so pleased that she's able to join us. Um, her, her title of her talk today is Recover, Restore, Reconnect, Cultivating Resilience and Supporting Vulnerable Children in an Early Years Setting. So over to you, Louise. Hey, thank you. I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, so um, it's great to be with you all today and with so many of you as well. And I think that uh, we're all here because we have children in our settings who we know need help. And basically we want to do our, our best to meet their needs. So finding out what to do, what to say, and then offering help early on we know that that can make all the difference to a child. So as an early years community, we need to come together in forums like this to share ideas and learn from each other. So when sharing today, I'm hoping we're going to start the conversations um, that will go on beyond the, the seminar tonight. I work with children aged two to 11 years in a primary school and nursery. And today I'm gonna to focus on the youngest children. So our nursery has been open all year through the lockdowns. And what we've noticed is we have an increasing number of children who have experienced trauma of different kinds. So we have children who have experienced bereavement, loss, separation, and a number of children who've been displaced in the last years, so they've moved from a place of safety to a place where they don't feel safe necessarily, or that that's very different to what they're used to. We also work with looked after children, and we've recently opened a hub for children who have special educational needs. Um, so we have quite a range of children who've had very different experiences. But for me, I've been a long time in education and I've often wondered, what is it that helps children to thrive after early trauma? So back in 2015, I started on a bit of a journey an action research project and studied with the Centre for Research in Early Childhood to try and discover what indicators and actions are taken in early year settings where children who have experienced some kind of trauma um, thrive. 
So as part of that project, I was able to visit lots of birth to five settings, including childminders, children's centres, early years settings and nurseries, and was able to talk to early years workers and also to work alongside a film crew, observing young children in their setting. And there were clearly children who were thriving in the face of adversity. So six years later, I'm still learning about this. But it's clear that there isn't one early intervention scheme or program or government catch up scheme that's really going to solve everything. But there are some very um, quick and easy actions that you can take in your early years setting that will make a difference to a child who's experienced trauma and it will help reduce feelings of anxiety and stress. So today I'm going to briefly share some of the findings from the project and some practical ideas and resources that I've seen working well in different early years settings and which are backed up by the research. So to start with, um, keep a child in mind. Think about a child in your setting. So someone who stands out, who maybe you're a little bit concerned about. What do you notice when you stand back and observe the child? And maybe you recognise some of these behaviours. These are all behaviours that we've seen particularly in the last few months with different children in our early years settings. Dealing with these kind of behaviours can be quite exhausting as a member of staff. And it's really difficult to um, move your focus from what's going on, what's happening, the problems. But what if you look deeper? So if you ask yourself as a, as a team and have a conversation about it, when does it occur? When do these behaviours occur? Is it when the child is hungry, when they're tired, when they're involved in structured or unstructured play? Maybe it's when they're indoors or when they're outside. Because if you can try and work out what's going on beneath the surface behaviour, maybe you can help reduce some of the anxiety by just reducing the stimulation, turning off the lights, getting some fresh air into the room or offering a snack. But then as a team, ask the question, when don't they do that? Can you capture the moment when the child is happy, relaxed and involved? Because if you can capture that moment, and it might just be a glimpse, if you can find out what it is that helps the child to feel happy and relaxed, then you can start to build those moments into a few minutes, into half an hour, making it a little bit longer each time. And as early years practitioners, we're very used to um, assessing the risk that children are under. So, we make home visits, we talk to parents, we collect in lots of paperwork. But actually in the past year, that's become very difficult to do. It's been much more difficult to have those face-to-face -face conversations. But what we found when we talked to early years workers was that they were using the characteristics of effective learning and you'll be familiar with those as part of the birth to five framework, but they were using these as an indicator of mental health competency. So if you think back to your child in mind, the one that you were thinking about at the beginning, are they curious? Do they play with others? And are they willing to have a go at something new? And if not, that's a good place to start to help the child to build up these competencies. The other thing that we, we found in, in lots of early, set, early years settings was that they staff had created physical spaces that are enclosed and feel safe. 
And sometimes it was the children who'd identified those spaces. And I've just got a few examples here. Now, in the current time, you need to think about your risk assessments. You need to think about the regu current COVID regulations in terms of enclosures. But it is possible to create spaces that are well ventilated. Earlier in the year, we, we identified a, a special tree that the children loved. So by putting ribbons on it, we created a special place. You'll see from all the examples here, it's not about buying something new. You can create it from what you've got in your setting. And actually, if you stand back and observe, you may well have those spaces already identified by the children in your setting. It doesn't have to be a permanent space. Use what you've got in the setting already and then add to it with a blanket, with cushions, with a basket of familiar books. And then you can tailor it to one child or you can make it for the whole group or the bubble. So identifying a physical space and then encouraging the children to imagine a virtual space. And when you're doing this, you're helping children to imagine and describe a space where they feel safe, relaxed and comfortable. It gives you an opportunity to listen to what the child is thinking and to learn more about what they're feeling. And the way that I've done that with very young children is through role play games imagining a virtual space. So we had a pair of old wellies that we sprayed gold. And when the children put on the golden wellies, it took them to lots of imaginary places. And then as we listened, we started to consider whether the child was more comfortable in indoor or outdoor spaces. Perhaps they remembered something from the past or maybe they were thinking about a place that they'd like to be in the future, but it helps us to learn more about what the child is thinking and feeling through playful conversations. Having a communication system that works for you and the child is really important. We are, to, if we're trying to reduce a child's level of anxiety, they need to know what's happening during the day, what's happening around them. And so there are various ways that, that we use um, in terms of pictures and signs and words in the setting to help children understand what's happening. So we use visual timetables. We have a now and next board to explain a new routine. So we can put, uh, there's a bit of Velcro and we can just put a, a photograph of what's happening now and then what's going to happen um, afterwards, the next step. We also use a lot of emotion cards to talk about feelings and we use these to play bingo games, but we also have them on lanyards uh, around the staff so that if a child reaches a crisis point, at any point we can use those cards to be able to help them to articulate how they're feeling and to start to introduce the vocabulary. We want to create a culture of listening across the setting. So talking about different communication, different kinds of communication with children. And with young children, we can do that by something that they can relate to. So the little dog um, expresses himself through nonverbal communication. How does a dog feel if no one understands him? And we get the children to can interpret how what the dog is trying to communicate. In the same way, you could do use pictures of a, a baby if the child has a, a baby brother or sister because they will relate to that. But encouraging the children to talk about communication and different forms of communication. As I've said, we use signs, pictures and words to find out what works best. There are different children relate to different 
uh, modes of communication. And we also find at different times, so if a child is uh, in a crisis point, then we find that signs and pictures work much better and we need to really limit the language that we use to reduce that stimulation. We use a lot of pictures and songs to establish consistent routines and play lots of charade games um, in the setting. If you, um, you will all have a key person, so someone to listen to the child, and it might be the key person that's allocated, or it might be somebody who connects with that child in particular. And as Teresa and Sheila talked about, giving them an opportunity to articulate um, how they're feeling and using the vocabulary with them. And these are just some examples of what we use to help them to do that. Um, so I can see that you're feeling really angry at the moment. Can you think about what's happened and using pictures that the children work with you on to um, reflect a social story or talk about what's just happened or what's about to happen next? Many of you will be familiar with the communication chain chain which if you've done any kind of speech and language really helps in deciphering what's going on for the children and the behaviours that they're showing. So children who have been through trauma sometimes find it really difficult to articulate and if you look at this process it's no wonder they find it difficult and they choose alternative ways to communicate with you. If you can identify the point in the chain where it breaks, then you can help the child to move on and use their words and their communication system rather than fighting or withdrawing or um, hitting out at somebody. And finally, for children who've been through trauma, they have really difficult memories of change. And so we want to create positive memories of being heard. So drawing attention to change in nature. Um, and we use our environment to take children out and to experience firsthand how change can be good and can be positive. We use lots of resources. So we use clay, we use malleable materials like clay, dough, cooking, paint, collage, lots of loose parts to try and talk through how change can be good, that an unexpected event or new experience will be okay. And we can support children through change with um, some strategies like a whoops card. We have one child who really responds well to that. To indicate a change of plan, we just show, show him the whoops card and explain what's going to happen. On the spot, hand-drawn social stories can really help a child to understand if there's a change in routine. We also create storybooks with the children and um, we have some of the examples here, but there are lots of lovely children's books out there that can encourage thinking and talking about different responses to change. And finally, the apple crumble machine, which doesn't have to be an apple crumble machine, it can be any kind of machine made from loose parts or your blocks or recycled materials, but helping children to learn to work together and to ask for help if they need it. Whenever we do this activity, children start off on their own creating their own machines, but very soon realise that they need to help each other and they need to support each other. So finally, what I would say to you is don't underestimate the difference you can make through your daily interactions with, with a child. You are best placed to give the child what they need because you are a person they already trust within the setting and in a place where they feel safe to be. So if you aim to build a connection with a child by playing alongside, you can interact with them, listening, introducing new vocabulary and engaging them in the game so that they can start to make friends. But what I would say is it takes time. So celebrate each small step 
and make sure you work together as a team. Recognize when you are having a bad day and ask for help. Notice when another member of the team is struggling and offer help. So stay in touch with how you're feeling through all this. The important thing is you're not on your own. So make use of the help from communities like this and from the Anna Freud resources. I'm going to hand over back to Camilla. Thank you very much. But I think it's really useful now to have a question and answer time. Thank you so much, Louise. That was wonderful. Really brought things to life. Um, so I would like to invite all of our wonderful speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones um, and we'll move to the section with um, the questions from the audience. Um, so I think one of the themes that's come up a, a number of times across the chat is um, around how um, early years practitioners um, can I guess, contribute to understanding what might be trauma and what might be something um, uh, neurodevelopmental, people have asked specifically about autism spectrum um, and people also suggesting that perhaps at times trauma symptoms look very similar to some of the symptoms of um, ASD and uh, how might they help pick that apart? Um, I wonder, Sheila, if you might be able to start with some thoughts on that. It's a great question and it's a tricky one because we, we talk about this a lot in our team. I mean, in fact, we were just discussing a family this week where I discussed um, an older child, a 15 year old who had had really significant early trauma. He was a, um, an, in an orphanage in Russia um, as a baby and had really no attachment figure for about the first 18 months. And I did an ASD assessment on him and he looked like he had classic autism, but he also had trauma. So I guess the first thing to say is that it's not necessarily true that one negates the other. You can be on the autistic spectrum and have had early relational trauma. But I think it is really important if you're not sure to think about um, potentially specialist assessment, but in your own settings, in the absence of being able to refer on, and I'm, I'm aware that there are huge long waiting lists for ASD assessment, there are some things that you can start to notice about particular behaviours that look quite different um, if it's the developmental disorder than if it's trauma. And there's quite a helpful grid that I often use called the Coventry grid. I don't know if others use that, but it does kind of categorise certain behaviours, like e eating behaviour is a really, a, a really kind of, accessible one because in nurseries you're often kind of looking at how children eat and it, it does does a really neat kind of explanation of what kind of um, particular kind of obsessional behaviors around food look like which might be more characteristic of an autistic presentation and then a more kind of traumatic response to food which might involve things like hoarding food putting it in your pocket sort of taking it away getting very anxious around food so there are kind of helpful frameworks that can help us break down certain behaviours um, that can distinguish them from uh, developmental disorders, from traumatic ones. And I'm, I'm happy to share that resource and I'm sure there's lots of other models that other people here might use. But I do think um, it is important clearly to, to sort of not rule out that there may be developmental disorder there and not to explain everything as trauma because you might miss something important. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Theresa or Louise, did you want to add anything? I think just to say that the, the strategies, particularly with visual support, can really help um, children. And so in some ways, although you might be still going down a referral pathway, um, in the meantime, to help you cope with the day to day, introducing visual support can really help a child and using pictures with them, using signs taking time to observe the child, to notice what works well um, and, and work together with your team, have the discussions um, and reflect on what works best for that particular child. 
think maybe one comment also following on from that in terms of observing the child over the course of time. I think if you offer a child a bit of a different experience uh, of an adult who, who's consistently available and interested and helps them name feelings, just to observe whether they can shift a little bit in terms of their capacity to name feelings or start to engage in more imaginative play. And that would be an indicator that potentially the trauma blocked that or the, the sort of lack of experience with the caregivers didn't allow them to develop that, but they might start showing some new behaviors or abilities with you. I, I guess it's also true to say, just adding on from that, that the same approach could be equally helpful, helpful whether it is ASD or trauma. Mm kind of naming feelings that all three of us were you know referring to about some noticing and naming feelings in the, in the child that would be extremely helpful whether the child has experienced trauma or whether they're on the on the autistic spectrum so it doesn't necessarily mean a totally different approach I think that the approach can be be really helpful and of course lots of non-autistic children look quite autistic when they're highly anxious and they might retreat into that kind of autistic state mm -hmm. so um, it is Quite often difficult to separate but it just it's about as Teresa said and I think Louise as well it's about watching and sort of noticing and, and doing an awful lot I agree with Louise that there's an awful lot you can do it doesn't have to go straight to referral and, and clearly people in this audience are in the ideal position to be doing a lot of that early help. Um, thank you so much I'm going to move us on to the next kind of area of questions. Um, people have kind of asked some questions around some of the strategies that have been suggested. Um, uh, one asking about praise and where um, perhaps praise was used in a coercive, abusive relationship, how they would, that could then be used um, in, a, you know, in, in a more kind of positive um, attachment framework in an early years setting. Um, people are also asking about boundary setting with traumatized children. I think it's something that I certainly hear from parents as well, how when you know your child's gone through something, how you can um, you know, provide that kind of uh, safe and predictable boundary, um, which can feel very hard if you know, the, the child um, responds uh, with challenge to that. So I wonder if you could speak to some of that. Well, I'm happy to pick up the question about limit setting, perhaps, uh, for children who've been traumatised. Okay. Um, so what I would say is that some children who've experienced particularly physical abuse, a very critical parenting, might have a, a sort of a fight or flight response, a sort of threat response to being told no, um, without that being a sort of tempered with empathy, empathy and understanding. So I, it's quite important to be just mindful how you come across and so you don't sort of put the boundary down without actually trying to make sense and help the child to understand um, why, what's on your mind, but also what might have gone on for the child to have behaved in that way and not to be too punitive or shaming about it. So really what I'm saying is a sort of combination of providing empathy for something feeling difficult um, when they hear a no, but as well as to stick to certain boundaries and be consistent because children can find it quite frightening not to be um, told no really because it makes them more powerful and that's quite scary as well. Thank you, Teresa. I think in early year settings as well, you can limit the physical space that, that you have sometimes, and I've heard of settings where they um, create a smaller space. So for a child who's in that sort of flight mode, at least if you know that they are going to, to run, they can't run far away and you can manage their behavior. And what you need to do is try and um, anticipate those kinds of behaviors so that you can make sure that the child is safe. And, and constantly reminding them that you need to keep them safe. That's why you're putting the boundaries in place is mm. in order to keep them safe. I think it's terribly hard for people out there that I can't see, but I know are out there uh, in, their, in their hundreds and thousands, um, being on the sort of, in the relationship to some of these children. It, 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 the, they're not 
kind of being able to predict a response, I think puts puts you in a difficult position because these children are often quite hard to read. And, you know, we know also that perceptual bias studies show that children who have been traumatized, they might read your face in a way that's entirely different from how you intend it. So, you know, I might be kind of looking a bit sort of interested. That could be seen as a very threatening face. And I think being aware of the impact of you on the children that you're with is terribly important. And it does mean often perhaps naming it as you're doing it so that, you know, don't make any assumptions that your nonverbal response that you might think is friendly and warm could be actually quite scary and off-putting. So you can just sort of say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm curious about what you're doing over there. That looks really interesting as opposed to just the look. These are some very perhaps basic tips, but quite important ones, I think, for, for, for workers. Um, kind of easy to, to forget because it, we, we're used to kind of assuming people can read our signals. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next kind of group of questions, which is really around working with parents. Um, there are lots of kind of sub questions to this, um, but uh, I wonder if we could start with um, any kind of thoughts or recommendations that the panel have around working with parents who themselves might be traumatized. Um, uh, Louise, do you have any thoughts on that? I think developing a relationship with parents, a relationship that's built on trust, um, so it, it's very difficult at the moment because of those face-to-face -face contacts and those informal opportunities to have a chat with parents and build that relationship. And so I think we have to work really hard in doing that with parents or creating opportunities. Um, but being able to check in with parents, so as they're dropping off children, you check in on how they're feeling and that. Um, also drawing on the support and network of people locally and organisations locally because it could be that as you're dealing with and working with the child in your setting you need to also bring in organisations that can help and support the parent um, and there are lots of organisations out there that um, will support support parents we have a family support worker in our school who um, can be brought in who builds relationships with parents and can support them but I know not every early year setting has that uh, kind of role within the setting but it may be that there's somebody within the local community who you could involve. Thank you Louise. Um, Sheila or Teresa is there anything you wanted to add? No, I would definitely echo trying to draw on other sources of support. I think it's it's a big ask to think that if you're a early years worker with responsibility for a, a very young child, that you've also got a responsibility for the well-being and mental health of the parents. You do need to call on other um, community support, other agencies, unless you have, as, as Louise sort of referenced, you know, you might have that support within your early years setting, in which case, fantastic if there's you know, parenting groups that can run alongside and I think that that's really a kind of great model because then you can give some of your insights as workers with the children that you're caring for to the parents and kind of facilitate that the relationship but but I think that you know where you have a real a real concern where you might be really worried about something that might be obviously at a safeguarding level or at a kind of high threshold level then you clearly need to be asking for outside outside help or if you just think there's a a long history there of trauma that's a bit overwhelming to deal with. I think getting support's really, really vital, but uh, it probably would also come back to that need for the team support that I was referencing in our presentation, that you shouldn't just hold that on your own. It must be so hard to say goodbye to a little boy or girl or baby at the end of the day when you've got a real worry about the family that they're going back to. And you need to obviously be talking about that in your teams and think about that together. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. I wonder whether I could ask you to kind of take the theme of parents and speak a little bit about, um, particularly people are asking about foster parents and adoptive parents um, who perhaps might be very likely to be working um, and looking after children who've 
experienced um, trauma or abuse. Um, and what advice would you have for the early years workers? I think your case, Teresa, your second, your younger child was a child in foster care, weren't they? I wonder, do you want to say something a little bit about what, what work we were doing? I mean, it might be sort of helpful for people to hear a little mm. about that. So I think when you work with children who've been traumatized or you care for them even, um, very strong feelings can be evoked in you. I think I was speaking to that earlier in the case studies. And so I think what's really helpful for foster carers and adoptive parents um, to be able to, to, to be voicing those feelings without um, being judged for it. Sometimes it can be hugely challenging, frustrating, um, and so on. And so I think that's a starting point really of building a relationship. And then really it's about making sense of things that happen with the child because a lot of what happens with children who are traumatized can be quite unpredictable and confusing initially. So it's about helping a foster carer or adoptive parent to make sense of the trauma and how it has affected specifically the child in their care as well as alongside that, supporting the child potentially with the trauma symptoms, but that's sort of what we do in our team. Um, but I think there's also something that you as Ali, um, years work, as I mean loads that you can do as we heard from Louise and, and also what we've been referring to, is uh, really starting to create a meaningful narrative for both the child um, in terms of what they experience on a daily basis with you. Sort of what, why is it upsetting um, when um, I think there was a question about the painting of the little girl and why and who ripped the painting apart? I think it was, um, uh, I forgot the name now, I'm sorry. Um, but um, uh, she ripped her painting um, apart and there was a sense that nothing she did um, was quite good enough. And I think the comment in the, in the chat was that that's very sad and it was very sad to observe it, but there was also huge amounts of anger because I think in some ways she felt, perhaps I would think that it's not good enough. So the way I guess I respond to that, that was also a question is to say, um, well, I can see it's really upsetting when something doesn't work out quite the way you really were hoping to, and you did such, you made such great effort to do that. So I know I'm, I'm diverting a little bit, but um, really what you're doing with the children, you might also encourage foster carers and adoptive parents to do, to make sense of experiences and put where, fe words to feeling states. I wonder as well about whether just to sort of it's a bit researchy and I don't want to sound too teachery, so I'll try and resist that. <laughs> but I'm interested in this work, but I, uh, there are a lot of studies that show that for adoptive parents and foster carers, when they are looking after and parenting a child who's experienced trauma and who doesn't, we call it you know, difficulties in mentalising, but where they kind of find it difficult to recognise thoughts and feelings in themselves and other people, um, that that impacts on the carer that you might have, you know, you might be the kind of most reflective sort of adoptive parent ever, but when you have a child that you're parenting who has got really significant difficulties in mentalizing, it impacts on your capacity to, 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 to really process thoughts and feelings and kind of name them. And so, you know, you might see that when you see um, adoptive parents or foster carers with, with very traumatized children, that they might be a bit frozen themselves because of the impact of being with those children uh, and clearly they they need some support and there's lots of there are lots of groups for foster carers and adoptive parents that that talk about this you know a lot about sort of living with with in a kind of trauma world I suppose trauma informed kind of parenting where you learn to manage that and and I guess kind of taking care of your own emotions and trying to regulate yourself around children who have been very traumatized is just so important because you can start to mirror, you know, we were sort of looking at foster carers who had very withdrawn children. And instead of kind of getting closer to them, they started to pull back a bit and think, oh, this child's kind of fine on their own, um, which is, you know, obviously the opposite of what they need, but it was just a kind of normal response to kind of fitting with the child's style. So supporting that and being aware of that is, is sort of really important. I hope I didn't go too teachery there. No, no that was great. Thanks, Sheila, really helpful. Um, Louise, is there anything you wanted to add? Just I'd say it's working together so that whatever you put in place is consistent for the child because it, it would be really unhelpful for the child to be moving between 
home between um, nursery and to experience different strategies being almost experimented and used with the child. But if you can agree on an approach that's going to work at home and in school, then from the child's point of view, it will be consistent. And that's much more reassuring. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll move us on to another area that's come up a few times in the chat. And it's around where trauma might present itself in a physical way. Um, which I think some of you touched on, but the idea that, um, you know, a child might be talking about a tummy ache or a headache or aches and pains. Um, do you have any thoughts about how, um, how to work with that? Um, but there's also been questions around um, how to um, share a kind of trauma understanding with other early years workers. So the kind of staff team, but also parents, um, when your sense is that those kind of physical symptoms um, are trauma related. Um, anyone um, want to go first on that? <laughs> um, I, can, I can describe, we have a little boy who um, has really struggled. And when we started to unpick uh, what was happening, his, um, it was the physical reaction and responses that we were seeing that were very, very aggressive towards us and towards other children. And um, we needed to uh, take it right back. It was him expressing himself. But when we talked to him, he actually, he was able to say he couldn't control bits of his body. When he was feeling stressed and anxious, his arm took on a mind of its own and um, it, it was his arm hitting us, it wasn't him. Um, and so we needed to do a lot of work around the body and the different parts of the body and the way it works together and different ways of expressing that feeling of anger or frustration, um, giving him the vocabulary as well. Um, and it takes time and you have good days and you have bad days. And it's remembering that when you have a bad day, that the next day is a new day and you start again and uh, pick yourself up and get going again. So again, it's very important that you work together as a team and support each other because it's not easy. Maybe if I can, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to add something a bit about the PTSD framework sometimes being a bit helpful. Um, I, can't, I quite like my frameworks because they just give me something to feel secure about. But, but I, I, you know, thinking about trauma and how children manifest it a lot, you know, a lot physically is kind of your question, isn't it? And, and I suppose sort of thinking about things like memory, sounds, you know, and how they impact on children, that I think that's the most um, I think the research shows that that's the most kind of salient feature of a, of a sort of post-traumatic response is that children remember the sounds more than they remember the sights or the smells. So, you know, if it's someone hitting somebody else or it's somebody shouting or whatever it is, that, that that's the kind of intru most intrusive sort of memory. Uh, and I guess it's quite hard to necessarily put that into words. Um, so it might be that that comes out as I've got, you know, I've got a pain in my head. Uh, which might be that there's lots of loud noises that are kind of intrusive memories of people shouting or being violent or whatever it is that's gone on in the home uh, or coercing them. And so I think trying to make meaning of that for a child to sort of understand that it probably does feel like a headache, that that's a kind of real report of what they're feeling. It's not a sort of made up thing, but actually why, you know, wonder why the head's hurting so much and, maybe putting some words to that, you know, perhaps your head's really full of things. I wonder what's in there. And I love lots of Louise's kind of creative, um, I want some golden wellies by the way, but I think <laughs> something about going into a place where you could draw that and sort of depict it for a child who can't verbalize it. You know, what does what is the head full of when it's aching? Perhaps it's got lots of shouty voices in it or, uh, or horrible sights. And that that's a way that you as a, an early years worker, I think, can be really creative in trying to get underneath some of those physical symptoms. 
sorry, Teresa, I, I spoke over you. No, not at all. <laughs> I think that's really helpful. I think the only thing I wanted to add is that I think it's quite a long process to move from expressing feelings and experiences through um, what, what, what hurts in, in a bodily sensation towards being able to name feelings. And as, I think that's just important to be aware of because otherwise, you know, that there's lots of effort that it takes to actually allow a child to develop that. And it won't, it will be in combination with what you offer as childcare workers, as well as, um, you know, working together with the parents or um, seeking additional support for the parents to be able to learn to do that a bit more if, if there's a bit of a, a difficulty in understanding and in connecting because ultimately it's about a child experiencing a sense of being thought about uh, and understood and actually it's very difficult to understand what goes on a lot of the time so um, just to be a bit patient and expect that that can take time I think is important. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions that's come up in a few different ways is um, how if you suspect trauma based on some of these helpful um, kind of signs that you shared with um, the audience, um, how might you go about exploring that um, sensitively and thoughtfully, whether that's with the parent um, or with the child themselves? What's your kind of advice around um, how you, what you might do with your kind of worries? <laughs> I agree with our lovely panel that I wouldn't put them on the spot too much. <laughs> They're all so kind to each other that <laughs> they want to let each other go first. And do you have any thoughts on that, Louise? Um, okay, so, so I think observing the child at play um, can be really useful. I think what you shouldn't do is go straight up and start questioning them because children will often say what they think you you want to hear um, so I for me observational uh, observ observing them at play is really useful um, I think also talking to parents and if you've already got that relationship with the parent that they they trust you then you are able to gently encourage them to open up see if the behaviors or that you're seeing in the setting are also happening at home um, and often a parent will open up if they've experienced that at home and it's causing them concern they will start to talk to you and then together you can come up with a plan of whether you're just going to stay and observe it for a while or whether you're actually going to seek help and look for um, some kind of early help to put in place. I think there's also perhaps something about um, when you have a very sensitive and tentative conversation with parents, um, I guess the way they respond to that and the way they're able to think about the child will be some indicator of, uh, you, know, you know, whether you can think together and understand it or whether actually there's more of a concern that perhaps you can't address directly or discuss or share with the parent and work it out. Um, yeah. And probably just in that observation theme, which I think would be definitely what I would and, and Teresa and our team, we would do a lot of is trying to just look rather than, as, as Louise said, you wouldn't want to sort of go straight in there and they probably wouldn't be able to say anyway. But it, I think there are sort of points where it's helpful to observe, aren't there? So perhaps, you know, points of separation and reunion, the kind of classic attachment um, kind of context, I think is really helpful. So, you know, what's it like when it's when the child's getting ready for the parent or carer to come and pick them up? How do they leave them in the morning? Um, you know, when is a kind of transition from one activity to another? How do they manage that? Um, and all those strategies that Louise talks about and those sort of set, creating those safe places, I think then become really important because you've noticed and named that there are particular things that are a struggle. And, you know, clearly there's some normal developmental stages here that also have to be taken into account that you know, very young children, you would expect them to be upset when their mum's dropping them off for the first time at the nursery. So you wouldn't immediately think that was trauma. So they're sort of putting it into a developmental context is really important too, of sort of what's normal kind of upset at separation and what's actually kind of something that's a bit out of the ordinary. So I think you're building up a bit of a picture 
but at perhaps particular points that relate to the attachment relationships. And, and of course, you've got in a, in a nursery setting, you've got other children. And so you've got an ideal kind of environment to see how um, babies and, and young children kind of handle relationships. You know, is a baby much happier when you take them away from the group? And, and what's that about? Or, or do they kind of start to show interest and curiosity in other people? And you know, so you've got a lot of kind of opportunities to sort of watch how mainly, I guess, they relate to others. And that can give you an awful lot of information. Um, but as Teresa said, it can take a long time to put that into words, probably. Thank you all. Um, next theme I wanted to kind of put to you was around um, kind of cultural differences in perhaps the experience or expression of trauma. Um, do you have any thoughts about where there may be some cross-cultural differences in the, the signs that you've shared with us or, or, or in your experience, are they applicable to children from a range of backgrounds? I have some experience, but I'm really kind of slightly hesitant to, to sort of pigeonhole as well, because of course families do things very individually. So I don't want to fall into saying this kind of family does this or this kind of, but I did have a strong um, impression when I was working in um, Ealing and Southall um, in West London, where there's a very large South Asian population of the physical manifestation of difficulties, not especially trauma. So probably sort of slightly off topic here because um, I didn't then work in such a sort of uh, uh, traumatized service or trauma focused service, but certainly um, a difference in kind of expressing difficulties in children uh, that I found there, particularly that families um, slightly unwilling and maybe also not sort of, um, Kind of so uh, comfortable with going for psychological help because I guess that's also part of what you have to consider in different cultures is it's not just about whether it is named and it exists but actually what's the level of comfort of seeking professional help um, and I think that can really vary from culture to culture um, so yeah I, but I, I think that it's really important to look at still the kind of relationships within, within a family, you know, within the context of the cultural norms of that family, but actually the detail of what's happening in that relationship. And of course, one has to not fall into stereotyping and saying that certain behaviours that wouldn't be acceptable in one culture are, are acceptable because they're in another family. That's a, that's the danger of, of getting too culturally specific. But I do think um, really important to consider it in the work. That's what we're trying to say on our in our slide presentation is that you know children will just experience discrimination so trauma can be heaped upon trauma if they find themselves looking and feeling very different from other children in their nursery that can be a really traumatic experience in itself but perhaps others have a bit mm. more to say about different cultures I mean I think one thing that I always find really useful so not to fall into pigeonholing um people which I think all of us might sometimes do um, is um, really being curious about sort of um, cultural explanations of experiences. So when I, I'm just thinking of Dilara and her foster carer who comes from a different culture, and I'm, for instance, I'm trying to develop a way of um, making sense with Dilara about what's happened to her early on. And part of that is me understanding how her foster carer would understand that. How would she talk about it in her culture? What would she think sort of the effect of something like that happening to a child would be? And how would she like to talk to Dilara about it? So, so that we can sort of um, marry it up and sort of come to a joint understanding really. Um, and sometimes it's about negotiating or um, really recognizing that there's a difference in understanding. Um, but I think as, as, soon, as long as it's out in the open, I think it can be thought about and worked with in some ways. Mm -hmm. Much. Um, I think, uh, sorry, I was going to just say, but working together as a team so that you're in touch with your own feelings and assumptions and be prepared to kind of challenge each other if you feel that um, you're making assumptions about a child and family because what we want to be is questioning you know and trying to to build relationships and work out what's going on for that child um, without making assumptions so as a team 
talk together, that kind of pedagogical discussion or debrief after different after your sessions are really valuable. Thank you. Um, well, one thing that's striking me, Camilla, through all these questions and just sort of the whole sort of event, which is really interesting, uh, and the questions are great, is just how much potential all of the people have at this seminar to really make a sort of massive difference that we're, you know, particularly Teresa and I, you know, you're seeing more children than us, Louise, but we're seeing sort of small numbers of children in a very kind of specialist setting, particular problems, whereas all the attendees here, here I'm guessing, have got a kind of there are a lot of children they're working with all the time and, and are seeing for, you know, potentially sort of six to eight hours a day. So the potential for kind of giving a different experience and a different relationship that could really be protective um, against trauma rather than sort of dealing with trauma is also really important because the non-traumatised children that you might have early on can have a really positive and secure relationship with you. And that just seems to me incredibly hopeful. That you're in that role and you can have that impact so that's kind of sticking with me a bit thank you sheila um i feel like that's a nice way to kind of round things up i wonder Teresa or louise whether you have a kind of parting comment to the audience and what you'd like them to kind of take away from your talk or the session today i i i think if you just look at the sheer numbers that are here today you know, this is clearly important to us as an early years community. Um, we are seeing more and more children who have experienced trauma or who are displaying behaviours that concern us. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of hope here because all of all of you are working um, to, to do the very best for the children that you're working with. And you are gonna have the, the skills and the ability to um, set up interactions with children that are really gonna make a difference. And you can start that anytime, you can start that tomorrow. There's no, you, no waiting lists or anything. You can do it on a daily basis with those children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Teresa, do you have any final comments? I think um, Louise uh, phrased that in a really lovely way, and I don't have much to add other than to say that I think it's amazing how many people came and are interested and really want to make a difference. And I also very much believe that everyone here can, on a daily basis, even with very small steps, make a huge difference to a child without even knowing Thing that's helpful to hold on to particularly when things get difficult with children and how little things can mean a lot thank you and a huge thank to, thanks to all of you um you wonderful speakers um and thank you to the support team that have set this up thanks to um our um interpreters and to all of you for coming um we had a lot of questions in the end um and so we didn't get a chance to go through them all um, which I'm really sorry, but I tried to get through as many as I could. Um, and can I just uh, also remind people to complete our feedback form because uh, it's so helpful to how we design these webinars. So thank you again, and I hope to see some of you again soon. Bye-bye.